here I really value your opinion because this one caught me a little bit off guard. And what researchers did here is they didn't look for basically reactions to the vaccine adverse event reporting system itself. What they were trying to do is do uh, genetic research in trying to find out why certain individuals here called the genetics of reactions to vaccination were more susceptible to vaccine reactions than others. Now, to give you a little backstory, the methods here was a survey between June and September, and this is part of the Helix DNA Discovery Project. Now, what I'm about to show you is the reaction rate from this study is a lot higher than I even anticipated. I'm not just talking mild reactions, we're talking severe reactions. And let's take an excerpt real fast before we look at the other research we're gonna to cover tonight, which is actually quite cool. All right, here we go. So let's go down here and let's just check this out. Now you tell me what you think. A minority, minority of individuals have severe difficulties with daily routine following COVID-19 vaccination. Now keep in mind, this is a survey of people which have been vaccinated. And then of course, this is not coming from VAERS, this is coming directly from people themselves. So there could be some confounding and so on and so forth, but to proceed. For the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, we observed that only 2.7% of individuals had severe or extreme difficulties in the daily routine after the first dose. And 10.2% had severe or extreme difficulties after the second dose. Now remember, we're not going to VARES. We're going directly to the people which had been vaccinated. For the Moderna vaccine, we observed that 4.4% of individuals had severe or extreme difficulties after the first dose. And this number grew to 19.5% after the second dose. For the Johnson & Johnson, obviously being one dose, you start right off the bat with 17.7% .7 had difficulties after this single dose. Now I wanna reiterate, had severe or extreme difficulties with daily routines after the first dose. Now, the genetics that they found that this, this uh, basically what this is called is human leukocyte antigen, uh, which you could find here, you go to Wikipedia, like I'm showing right here, that you know, in reference to like transplants, autoimmune disease, and so on and so forth, is predominantly found in individuals of European genetic ancestry. And the reaction rate between of this was quite significant, actually at least twofold greater opportunity for reactions than individuals that did not have that. But we'll, cover, we'll review this again a little bit later on towards the end. And again, I'll wait till this renders in 4K. Once it renders in 4K, as always, I'll have a bookmark so you can go straight to the study later on. And that study, which I just showed you, just came out. So they're getting really a really chance to review it much more in detail, which I'm reviewing with you right now as we're going along. But wow, if you're looking at a 19% severe or extreme reaction rate after the second dose, now could the survey participants uh, be more likely to re respond in a negative light because of that or otherwise? I don't know. Again, confounding and, and surveys are really, really complex. And I don't know what they, uh, they basically measure it up against in order to make sure the outcome was uh, clean. But wow, that was, uh, that was bizarrely high to me, even myself. But to begin, we'll be covering rapid and effective vitamin D supplementation will present better out clinical outcomes in COVID-19 patients by altering serum. Da -da 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 -da. What it is is actually pretty cool because you can see exactly the level of vitamin D that they were administering and in order to get the outcomes, which we'll review in a little bit. Then as well, vitamin D serum levels Tested for subjects with SARS-CoV-2. Let's just get this out of the way real fast uh, because visual graphics work just great. And here we are right there. What we're looking at is people that don't get COVID. That's their serum vitamin D levels. People that have COVID and not recovered. That's their serum vitamin D levels. And people that had COVID and recovered. So you kind of want to be in this group there. You see what I mean? But otherwise, outside of that, it's just a real good observational uh, aspect in reference to the correlation of vitamin D and even catching COVID. Again, this debate's been going on since the very beginning of actually the whole pandemic to start off with. But so we'll cover that and get out of the way right now. Then also our arginine and COVID-19, a great update. Uh, 
what you'll find out the vitamin D and L-arginine actually go hand in hand. I'll, but I'll highlight the flat for a second. Also as well, beta glucons. Um, let's get this out of the way too, real fast, right? The beta glucons they're finding right now have a very strong potential in helping with uh, basically certain pandemic or uh, related outcomes. And but what I like about the study and the reason I want to link it is not because any direct studies that this particular study, a study of studies has done on its own, but because the reason being it's a valuable resource in reference to basically the beta glucons in connection to other studies, uh, which have a promising outcome. And let's go right here. Previous studies indicate the potential of beta glucons in the prevention of treatment of complications of COVID-19. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Immunomodulatory antioxidant neuroprotective anthrombotic. See, activities are of particular interest here. There's still a few studies using beta glucon from edible mushrooms for COVID. Edible micro, macro fungi appear to be an excellent source of beta glucons for clinical applications due in part to lack of toxicology risk from fungal toxins. Because this edible mushrooms can be used to produce both highly purified beta glucon preparations as well as less purified cocktails. However, careful studies, so on and so forth, need to be done. All right, I wanted to show you that right off the bat, a great uh, portal study that can lead you to other studies in reference to basically helping you achieve the outcome that you desire. All right, after that, uh, plant-derived antiviral uh, drug is effective in blocking highly infectious SARS-CoV-2 Delta variant. And this is uh, Thapsigargan. I think it's actually pronounced Thapsigargan. It's actually kind of cool, otherwise also known as deadly carrot. All right, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Repurposing familiar drug for COVID-19, disulf uh, disulfiram. This is amazing. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not a big prescription drug person, but the outcome observationally of individuals that were taking this and everything else is just astounding. Also too, uh, association prognostic accuracy of electrolyte imbalances, really cool study. Uh, you may not know what this word is right here, hypernatremia, but you will in a second. And it's 97% related to poor outcomes as well. All right, many of the medical field already know what that is. And yeah, something like that there is amazing. All right, there we go. Oh, one was good away. Uh, just a, a societal study in reference to how actually the, the environment became worse during COVID and not better. Uh, and actually created a feedback loop that can make things far worse for future pandemics. Just a side note, it'll be linked for you also as well. Uh, continued effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccination among yeah, that's kind of a really cool uh, thing right there at the bottom. We'll cover that. Uh, COVID-19 vaccine lists as weak antibody response and people taking immunosuppressants. And I'm talking a lot of people take uh, medications, rheumatoid arthritis, irritable bowel syndrome, colitis, so on and so forth. So this affects a lot of people. Now, the weird part about it is they produce the same amount of antibodies uh, that healthy individuals to produce. The problem is the antibodies are kind of like, you know, lazy. But to proceed forward is that not the people, the antibodies. Wait, if, this is an amazing correlation in reference to malaria. They went to Africa and they expected to see the massive amount of negative you know, outcome and you know people being sick and not recovering and so on and so forth. No, no, <laughs> no. All right, after that, and then to a really good uh, controlled study in reference to transmission of individuals in prisons. Uh, because no one's going anywhere and it's easier to monitor and wait to find out what they found out. Our data sources as well, as far as numerical data, uh, is going to be basically your, your vigilance, uh, our world and data, which also uses John Hopkins university and also GIS aids bears. Let's get this, uh, let's get the disclaimer out of the way, marking the time bah, bah, bah. Ooh, before I do that. All right, here we go. Check this out. Ready? This is the zip file size, 2021. For those not familiar, this is the zip file size. And zip file just means it's, for those not familiar, it's a specially packaged group of data in a more condensed version, and it's easier to compare year to year. So 2021 is 155, 2020 is 111.32, and so on and so forth. But you want to see what it looks like visually? Check this out. This gives a greater impact. Here it goes. Oh, not that. Let's go to here. Oh, by the way, 
Uh, before we get to here, this is just showing you that areas fully vaccinated per 100. We'll get to this data in a little bit as is November 19th. Um, I'm sorry, uh, data analysts and scientists and epidemiologists. You know, 0 to 10 and 11 to 20 people vaccinated per 100. Um, I'm just I'm just not seeing the correlation that some people are seeing. I don't know. Does that look like the, the more you vaccinated, the better it works? And I'll show you Singapore when we get to that in a second too, but that's towards the end of the night. But here we go. Ready? Check this out. Zip file size. Da, da, da. Here it is. Bear zip file size with the years. Keep in mind, each one of these is the years. For example, you can see, ooh, that's really small. But let's see, for example, and let's make, and what you're seeing here is this is the zip file size for 2021. This is all the vaccine anniversary reaction reports dropped on the desk of the CDC. So far, years getting close to over up to November 19th. All right. And this is how much data. This is why I I don't have a great deal of confidence that the that there's enough staff in the CDC to actually look what they call safety signals. Um, let's try to make this bigger. Let's see. But however, though, it is just, it's just astounding to me. Let's stop. Oh, that's yes. Yeah, so a little bit bigger, but yeah. So that's the zip file size right there. You know, there's 20, 20, 11.32. There's 20. You can't even see it. This is like one of those astronomy graphics that you'd actually watch on the discovery channel, the science channel. And here's the sun and here's your solar system. And you know, there's your sun, and there's like there's there's Pluto if it's still a planet. I don't know. I get confused. It was a planet back in 1990, but you know that that type of thing. You know, and so that is zip file size. Those people that don't, don't follow this, oh my gosh, you don't realize how many reports are coming into the vaccine universe reporting system. Uh, more than if I show you here, get out of the way. This is all the years prior. And this is this. And if we go to file size comparison, let's just show you. Then we'll get this back to the chart. This is all the vaccine adverse event reports submitted as of January 2021 to today compared to the three decades prior that see people have a hard time comprehending that, which means the size of the file itself is 27% greater than the three decades prior. And I just don't, I have a hard time fathoming that the media has not caught on to that. This is simple, simple data analytics. It doesn't, I mean, you're just pulling data from the charts. We're just going, we're looking at this going, oh, let's just put that in a file form. But that's our file. And let's get to the disclaimer, all right? 13 minutes in the disclaimer for VARES, just as because we, before we go through the, the, the reports, very important monitoring of vaccine safety. Various reports alone cannot be used to determine if vaccine cause or contributed to an adverse effect or illness. Reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. A large part of errors are voluntary, which means they are subject to biases, meaning please don't censor me. But otherwise, outside of that, that it's it's just phenomenal. All right, then the GISA, and I'm debating next week to show our team on how to either pull data from the European database or whether I should show them how to pull uh, basically data in reference to variants of concern and mutations uh, from the GISA database. But beside that, let us begin with our first study. Again, vitamin D. Uh, rapid and effective vitamin D supplementation may present better clinical outcomes in COVID-19. Patients by altering serum, da 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 All right, here we go. The main thing is you'll have the link to the study. But let's get the highlights. Results. Our, again, we're quoting, our treatment protocol increased the serum 25 OHD level significantly to above 30 nanograms a milliliter within two weeks, two weeks. COVID-19 cases, no comorbidities, no vitamin D treatment, da, da, da. All right, overall had a 1.9 fold increased risk of having hospitalization longer than eight days compared with the cases with comorbidities and vitamin D treatment. So think about this. All right, Re let's read that again. So they're looking at cases with no com comorbidities, meaning, for example, they don't have diabetes, heart disease, and so on and so forth. And they're comparing against people that are already 
have some other challenge, health challenge, with vitamin D treatment, and the individuals who are going in with low vitamin D and nothing else, no diabetes and heart disease, still almost have twice the increased risk of hospitalization longer than eight days than compared to those which have diabetes, heart disease, and vitamin D. Having vitamin D, D treatment also decreased the mortality rate by 2.14 times. That's significant news. And of course, obviously, you know, you're not going to hear it except prior from this channel and a few other outliers out there. Outliers. Is that the word that says outliers? Conclusions. Vitamin D treatment shortened hospital stay and decreased mortality in COVID-19 cases, even in the existence of comorbidities. Vitamin D supplementation is effective on the various target parameters. Therefore, it is essential for... Um, don't fact checkers. I'm only reading the quote. It is essential for COVID-19 treatment. All right. Then done. We go down here. Do, 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 do. Some of the other highlights, which are important. They gave about 10,000 IUs of, uh, daily of vitamin D supplementation for 14 days was sufficient to increase the vitamin D serum concentrations, at least in Western Mexican populations. So basically 10,000 IUs a day for about 14 days is what they end up utilizing. Now that's not even, that's even on the low end of some of the studies, because we could look at right here uh, in certain other areas. For example, they found that COVID-19 patients with hypovitamin to hypo, Vitamin tosis D had elevated interleukins, uh, but they used uh, 60,000 IUs daily of vitamin D for eight to 10 days compared with patients who receive standard treatments. Again, consult your medical professional. All right, now, this is important because remember the nitric oxide, remember how we connect all of our studies and basically how one thing plays into another. Now, for example, the nitric oxide is going to play a huge role when we go to the L-arginine. Makes sense? Here we go. All right, nitric oxide functions as an immune mediator and plays an important role in vascular and inflammatory lung diseases. Although a relation was not investigated with uh, neuronal nitric oxide synthase, NOS1, remember it's towards the top, vitamin D was suggested to be the regulator of inducible nitric oxide synthase. And endothelial nitric oxide synthase 3, the final product of NO are nitrite and nitrate. So, the reason I brought that up is because when we get to the L-arginine study, it'll make more sense. And plus two, vitamin D and L-arginine may be a better combination than L-arginine and O, but that's adding publisher bias, and that can alter an outcome. But we always stick with the outcomes. Negatively correlated in cases that did not receive supplementation, positively correlated in cases that received supplementation in our study as far as vitamin D. And that's the highlight. The link will be there to the study itself. But I didn't even catch that the first time that they were comparing vitamin D supplementation in individuals with comorbidities uh, against individuals that had no comorbidities. That's like a huge handicap uh, in, in basically the, how we're formulating or gathering uh, data because you want to compare apples to apples, but they weren't. They, their study group was actually more challenged than the, the other study group, and they're still had a decreased mortality rate by 2.14 times. That's astounding. All right, now we go to the next one. L-arginine. L-arginine is involved in many different biological processes, and recent reports indicated it could play a crucial role in coronavirus diseases 2019. Caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, herein we represent an updated system, the systemic, systematic overview of the current evidence on the functional contribution of L-arginine in COVID-19, describing its actions on endothelial, endothelial, Cells and immune system in discussing a potential as a therapeutic tool emerged from recent clinical experimentations. And let's look at it. Let's pull some highlights out. Da, 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 da. Great information, great information. And ah, there was no highlights. That was so good. You, you get the idea. And they found that African American individuals tend to be particularly low in the allergenine itself. So that can also play a role in why the outcomes may be worse in certain ethnic groups. And that's what it comes down to be. Oh, here it is. This one I check out. This is the dosaging that was used in some of the studies that's important as well. Here, to actually test L-arginine, I'm going to hide this up. There it is. To actually test L-arginine in COVID-19 patients based on the rationale described above, we designed a randomized clinical trial to test the effects of adding L-arginine orally, that's probably a brand name, 1.66 grams twice per day to standard therapy in patients hospitalized for COVID-19. The interim results recently published revealed that patients who received 
L-arginine had a significantly reduced duration of the in-hospital stay and diminished respiratory support compared to patients in the placebo arms. And so you go through here, it gives you a really strong uh, insight into recommending a Y-L-arginine and nitric oxide, nitric oxide, NO, I should say, uh, has uh, basically a very, very powerful effect on the immune system, as well as the outcomes in regard to COVID-19, in at least in reference to this study itself. And again, where we first hear that, ironically, which I didn't realize, was right here. You see the NOIS1, one, one, and you go down here, productive vitamin D, just to reiterate uh, through our information, to reinforce it at the same time too, was nitric oxide functions as an immune mediator. And where is that NOS1? Although a relation was not investigated with neurologic nitric oxide NO1, vitamin D was suggested to be the regulator of inducible nitric oxide synthase and endothelial nitric oxide synthase NO3. Da, 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 the final products are NO nitrate and nitrate. Yeah, kind of went backwards there. But there it is. You see what I mean? And so they all begin to play a role together per se, even if not necessarily investigated as for per on directly with it, you could see how it begins to play a role in coordination. All right, next after that, ba -ba -ba. let's see, oh, how did that go down here already? Oh, is this the allergy one? No, it's the beta glucose one. All right, we got the beta glucose one out of the way. Cool, we'll have the link for that as well. Check this out. Now, this plant-derived antiviral drug is effective in blocking highly infectious SARS-CoV-2 Delta variant, says scientists. A plant-based antiviral treatment for COVID-19 recently discovered by scientists at the University of Nottingham has been found to be just as effective at treating all variants of the virus SARS-CoV-2, even the highly infectious Delta variant. Just the highlights. In the previous studies, the team showed that the plant-derived antiviral at small doses triggers a highly effective broad-spectrum host center antiviral innate immune response against three major types of human respiratory viruses, including SARS-CoV-2. Notably, all SARS-CoV-2 variants were highly susceptible to, and of course, this was Thapsigargan. Thaps, uh, notable two Thapsigargan treatment, a single pre-infection, a single pre-infection priming dose of TG, single, single dose of TG effectively blocked all single variant infections in every co-infection at greater than 95% relative to controls. Likewise, TG was effective in inhibiting each variant during active infection. That, again, together with these results, point to the antiviral potential of TG as a post-exposure prophylactic and active therapeutic agent. Now, that's amazing. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, I won't link this in the YouTube th unless you want me to, but I will. Uh, Thapsigargan from Judicial Medicine to Anti-Cancer Drug been used for centuries in folk medicine to treat rheumatic pain, lung diseases, and female infertility. Uh, but also too, just the history, deadly carrot was what it was called due to its high toxicity to sheep and cattle. So there's your caveat, but still just the same, has amazing history and maybe it's time has come to be reevaluated. All right. After that, da -da -da, that's a gargan, uh, deadly carrot. Just remember deadly carrot and uh, it's easier to remember. All right. Repurposing a familiar drug for COVID-19. Now, this is an amazing observational study. And the reason being is because it's effectiveness. Uh, in, it wasn't like being planned to be used for COVID-19. Just that some real observant uh, researchers, you know, at Harvard Medical School, so again, uh, picked up this, this signal. And if this correlation observation has weight, wow. And again, disulfiram treatment is usually for alcoholism. It's been around for a long, long period of time, and it's got a good track record. And this was in, vet, in vets. Uh, but here we go. I'm just going to read you the highlights. Here, da, 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 da. Analysis included 944,127 veterans 
where they had at least one SARS-CoV-2 between February 2020 and February 2021. Of these, 2,233 had been prescribed uh, disul uh, disulfiram for alcoholisms. Alcoholisms? Alcoholisms. Veterans taking disulfiram had a 34% lower incidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection than those who weren't. This is the part that caught my attention. More, moreover, no one on disulfiram was, who was infected with the virus died, compared with 3% of those infected and not on the drug. Let's reiterate again. More than one, more than more than one, no, actually no one, no one on disulfiram who was infected with the virus died. No one on disulfiram who was infected with the virus died. 2,233 individuals. That's probably enough to get a strong correlation uh, with the virus died compared to 3% of those infected and not on the drug, which started from February 2020 with the different variants, for example, Alpha and so on and so forth. And the, the original was a DG614, remember with the wild type, uh, which had a much higher mortality rate back a while ago. Uh, I, I think probably at least equivalent to Delta today when it first hit, because uh, was basically, um, I know it makes no sense because you're looking at you know, the Delta rate seems to be so much worse. But if you look back at that time and I show you the graphs and the charts, uh, either treatment was poor or something was off, but it was about equal in mortality rate to today. Uh, that's pretty significant. So Dalsulfiram uh, may be coming into light pretty fast. Remember the other gout truck we looked at a, a few weeks ago too? They also benefit, there's some, they're actually pulling a lot of good signals out from things that can actually help. This drug is FDA approved and has been prescribed for over 60 years as a treatment for alcoholism. It is safe, inexpensive, and familiar to physicians and widely used in many countries. Now, that's interesting because I'm not going to say any names, but there's a lot of medications that we covered. One, one of my videos was pulled a long, long time ago. And now they're trying to say the drug is for, um, you know, horse worms when it actually it was it's an incredible medication. Uh, but now we're talking about that sulfuram. They said the exact same thing. It is safe, inexpensive, and familiar and widely used in many countries. So if that quote sounds familiar in correlation with other types of medications. Let's see where this leads. But this is research from Harvard um, Medical School. And I sure hope, sure hope that they don't attempt to censor uh, basically observational studies from Harvard Medical School, because then we're certainly going to be in a world of trouble. All right, after that, let's continue. After this, associations and prognostic accuracy of electrolyte imbalances and predictor poor COVID-19 outcomes, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of 28 observational studies. Objectives. To systematically clarify the association and prognostic accuracy of electrolyte imbalances, sodium, calcium, potassium, magnesium, chloride, and phosphate, and predictor poor COVID-19 clinical outcomes. Now, here's the catch. All right, hypernatremia. Now, it can be a couple of different things. Uh, let's just look at the example. Well, let me read you the, the line first before I go to the actual what it is. Hypernatremia is 97% specific for a poor outcome, and the association is independent of inflammatory marker levels. Further studies should evaluate if correcting these imbalances can help improve clinical outcome. For those not familiar, hypernatremia most often occurs with people who don't drink enough water. Now, by not drinking enough water, that can mean they can have elevated sodium concentrations, all right? So there's a correlation, but most frequently not drinking enough water which is ironic because how many times people go to the hospital, do they still give saline solutions through an IV uh, the second you go into a hospital? Because if they do, and this and that is 97% uh, correlated with a poor outcome, uh, that may be a, a treatment paradigm, which may need to be rethought it. You know what I mean? So 97% specific poor outcome potentially being not drinking enough water. So just as a heads up, some of these mitigation factors are very simple to stay healthy. Now you could drink too much water, 
but or you can lower your sodium concentration down however you do it I don't know but still just the same it is good information to know so if, if the concern is there with any illness dehydration is a problem and so stay hydrated next proceed nature I'm not going to go into this article too much. All I'm going to say is basically what happened was during the pandemic, all these enforcement and forest protections got relaxed and sustainability agreements all basically fell into like some sort of deregulation. And so basically the environment base totally got messed up. And so people thought, you know, these lockdowns and things like that, oh, it's going to be good for the planet, the less, you know, climate change or whatever the argument was. No, that's not what happened. Real world events do not do not uh, do not mimic directly what's on paper. So this means that COVID-19 epidemic sparked by a pathogen spilling from animal to human population has played a part in fueling the further deforestation, which in turn increased the risk of future zoonotic diseases, emergence by increasing human wildlife interactions, and so on and so forth. And again, they said, quote, science investigated links between COVID-19 epidemic and the deterioration of the world's ecosystems and their biodiversity, discovering feedback loops suggest potential increase in future pandemics. So all they're just basically trying to say is, you know, next time you do this, do it better. Uh, and, you know, people don't realize about the face mask and the face shields, uh, the chemicals that they use in the surgical masks, um, you know, were relaxed. So people, you people have no clue what they're putting. I mean, do you really know what the ingredients are in your surgical mask or your face mask? I really, really think if you don't, it may be worthy a quick look to see exactly what chemicals are used in the manufacturing of um, face shields. And it'd be quite enlightening. But, and then they want kids to wear them 24 seven, uh, so to say, well, at least that in public. But here to proceed, all right, after that. Continued effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccination among urban healthcare workers during the Delta variant predominance. Uh, now, this is not going into the study itself, but I want to take you a snippet from the study itself, which is important in regard to natural immunity. A lot of these, the problem is that a lot of this research gets buried because people just read the title and they don't, they don't see this. There's, it's data. Data is the gold of the future. People think gold, gold and silver. No, data. And that's why Twitter no longer makes a difference anymore because they, when they censored all the people until they have like some sort of social harmony, which they're attempting to accomplish, then data mining, Twitter and Instagram, and everything else became useless. Because once you start censoring people, then you're not getting as true reflection of society anymore. And so that's why I dropped the basically the sentiment analysis from Twitter. Whoop, what that pop up there? That is not to get that away. All right, here we go. Independently, we found no reinfection among those with prior COVID-19. This is for my healthcare workers out there, which are, uh, which are, you know, my healthcare friends. Independently, we found no reinfection among those with prior COVID-19 prior COVID contributing to 74,557 reinfection-free person days, adding to the evidence base for the robustness of natural acquired immunity. Oh, yeah, you got they had breakthrough infections in the vaccine group. But the people that already had COVID-19, that doesn't mean get COVID-19. Not like we did in the 60s and 70s when we had measles parties and everything else like that. You know, it's, you know, survival of the fittest. So they're not saying that. They're just saying basically people that had COVID-19 prior, uh, at least in their particular study, did not have COVID-19 later. So how you want to end the pandemic, there's many ways to do it. And there's other ways to do it. Proceed forward. All right. And after that, COVID-19 vaccine elicits weak antibody response and people to take immunosuppressants. People hear immunosuppressants and a lot of individuals don't realize which are taking inflammatory bowel diseases or so forth, uh, uh, psoriasis, they're taking the immunosuppressants. So when they say immunosuppressant, you're not thinking people looking for like organ transplants. We're talking everyday people. And so the problem with it is this, and this is a really good point because there's confounding introduced into a lot of the studies because they're just testing the antibody levels. Well, these researchers went a little further and wanted to see how good those antibodies are to proceed. People taking immunosuppressants had about the same level of total antibodies three months after the second dose as healthy people, but their antibodies were lower in quality. 
The 12 people in the study on TNF inhibitors had particularly deficient antibody response compared to other people. Immunosuppressed people had lower levels of neutralizing antibodies. The most potent kind capable of blocking viruses from infecting cells without any help from the rest of the immune system. So that is the antibody. That's just antibodies as a whole. That's like building a house and saying, oh, I have a bunch of people coming over to help build a house. Well, how many are carpenters, electricians? Well, you have none. You know, so basically it's not the amount of people that you have to build the house, but people you have that are capable of building the house. Same thing with antibodies. You have tons of antibodies. But how many antibodies you have capable of actually fighting a virus? That's what they're trying to say. Situation worsened over time. Uh, this, Six months of the second dose, 17% of the healthy participants had dropped below the estimated threshold protection. In comparison, five months after the second dose, 58% of the immunosuppressed people and all taking TNF inhibitors had most likely lost protection against breakthrough infections. And of course, you know, the, the response is going to be boosters. Well, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if eventually if you can build a tolerance to a vaccine. Because this is this is entering the twilight zone. And number one, you have a leaky vaccine. And I don't have to tell you what happens if you keep administering a vaccine that is not very effective at reducing transmission and viral fitness and escapes and everything else like that and pathogen replacement. Uh, obviously, there's people far more versed than I am in it. And I'm sure they're more well aware. In fact, I find it criminal. Uh, the vaccine is, is so leaky. Uh, and if you want to keep on doing it over and over again, that's to me personally, uh, from an immunological standpoint, well, if you have an immunologist out there, you tell me. All right, next, after that. COVID-19 annual re research released, by the blah, at that myth annual meeting. This is intriguing because it's not so much the fact it's what they, it's how in the reaction because the bias that they were honest about going into looking at the research, uh, going into these areas for tropical medicine, and you could see that, that the shock when they had an assumption of something being a certain way, but it was not. You ready? Here we go. Real interesting. In Mali, new data suggests high, show high rates of infections, but low burden of disease, meaning it's like the common cold. I'm not saying it's the common cold, but it's, you know, the association, that's the best way I can use the analogy. And they went there expecting to see people like, ah, you know, basically sick, you know, not recovered, long COVID and so forth and so forth. And they're like going, huh? Yeah, I had COVID and big deal. So here it goes. Yeah, for further screening found there was no difference. And they looked at 2,700 people, da, da, da. They found that 60% of people had been infected. And some rates are in some areas. But yet further screening found there was no difference in respiratory or gastrointestinal symptoms reported by people who had been infected versus those that had not. I Meaning look at the background rates. Meanwhile, hospitalizations were the same for in each group. It says three, three out of 2,700 people. There is just not the same level of symptoms, complications, hospitalizations, and deaths you see in a population in the United States that has experienced a high rate of exposure. It said, so they're comparing Molly to the U.S. and the U.S. is just being, you know, devastated for whatever reason. Molly, it's like, hmm, all right. And so it's basically like the rest of the sub, sub -Sah saharan Africa, the population in Mali is relatively young, but this comparatively low burden of COVID-19 disease remained unchanged even when we adjusted for age. The researchers said, uh, the other researchers found no evidence to suggest people Infected people were protected by a pre-pandemic exposure to a different type of coronavirus. So they're exposed to the same people we think we're having here in the United States. You know, he said there is some speculation that routine exposure to malaria and other diseases common to Mali trains the immune system to refrain from overreacting to SARS-CoV-2 infection. That's a, a shout out to George Carlin as inflammatory reactions are a significant cause of COVID-19 complications and deaths. Now, fast forward to Uganda. I love how these studies, they, there's always a correlation. Like one study, they, they all relate. It's like a puzzle piece or puzzle piece or puzzle with pieces. In Uganda, high exposure to malaria, separate study, linked to lower risk from COVID-19, believe it or not. In potentially related study, uh, researchers working in Uganda found COVID-19 patients with high rates of exposure to malaria were less likely to... This, again, it's not the same research. 
This is two parallel researchers that, that just happen to discover the same outcome or a possible correlation or whatever, observation. We're less likely to suffer from disease or death than patients with low exposure. We went into this project thinking we would see a higher rate of negative outcomes in people with a history of malaria infections because that's what we've seen in patients co-infected with malaria and Ebola. Uh, basically, uh, this is the malaria concern. We actually were quite surprised to see the opposite, that malaria may have a protective effect. Now, obviously, the takeaway here is no one's saying go get malaria, but to proceed. She said that an assessment of 597 hospitalized COVID-19 patients found only 5% of patients, only 5% of patients with high levels of previous malaria infections suffered severe or critical outcomes, compared with 30% for patients with relatively low levels of malaria exposure. We're not talking like in the U.S., no exposure, because I'd be curious who that correlation would be. We're talking people which had a little bit of malaria exposure compared to a lot. The more malaria exposure they had, the stronger the immune system. She said, quote, the potential protective effect from malaria infections could help explain why the pandemic has thus far not produced high levels of deaths many feared would occur in Africa. And shout out to South Africa. South Africa went crazy with lockdowns in the beginning and created, I mean, more people have probably succumbed to starvation and lack of access to medical um, and health care and so on and so forth due to the lockdowns. If this is the case, then then it should have ever happened. And my friends that work with the United Nations, UNICEF and so on and so forth, uh, the, the lockdowns have had, an, and people, you know, we're in the United States, we don't see it. And our media doesn't uh, report on it, but if you actually knew how damaging the lockdowns had been to many areas which were required first world assistance to some expect, uh, you, you, would, you would, it's tough not to um, feel uh, the proper amount of emotion. Let's put it that way. So bottom line is plasmodium, the malaria parasite potentially, something plays a role there uh, on an evolutionary level where malaria, well, think about syphilis. And so, you know, how they all play a role, syphilis, malaria, and now COVID-19, intriguing. But remember, remember when I was doing the charts in Africa and everyone was waiting for COVID to do something in Africa? And it's like, here you have an area which has not exactly the greatest access to medical whatever. And it's like, it's like when's COVID going to hit? When's COVID going to hit? And now maybe we have a, a good hypothesis as to why not. Then, the last of the research articles before going to go into the data analytics, transmission potential of vaccinated and unvaccinated persons infected with SARS, CV-2 Delta variant in the federal prison system. You ready for this? Here we go. No significant differences were detected in duration of RT-PCR positivity among fully vaccinated participants versus those not fully vaccinated or in duration of culture positivity among fully vaccinated participants Overall duration of culture positivity was shorter among Moderna vaccine recipients versus Pfizer or Janssen vaccine recipients. Conclusions. As this field continues to develop, clinicians and public health practitioners should consider vaccinated persons who become infected with SARS-CoV-2 to be no less infectious than vac unvaccinated persons because I can't stand it, but we both know that certain uh, high profile individuals said it's a pandemic of the unvaccinated. But to reiterate the research, and I'll have a link for this as well too. Conclusion, as this field continues to develop, clinicians and public health practitioners should consider vaccinated persons who become infected with SARS-CoV-2 to be no less infectious than unvaccinated persons. These findings are critically important, especially in congregate settings where viral transmission can lead to large outbreaks. And again, the link will be there for you as follows. And I'm going to pause it for a second and I'm going to go right into the data analytics and be back in a second. And I'm back. And you know what? I almost forgot. I was going to cover a little bit more detail of the first study we opened up with. You ready? Let's, let's begin real fast. All right. So let's go to do-do-do. Here we are. 
The HLA A03 1 is associated with increased risk of fever, chills, and more severe reaction to Pfizer BioNTech COVID 19 vaccination. So I want to read you the highlights since we covered a lot of it already in the beginning pretty heavily. The genetics of reaction to vaccination. Now, 17,440 participants in the Helix DNA Discovery Project and Healthy Nevada Project. Now, remember, this was a survey, and I'm not a big fan of surveys, but still just the same. The reaction rate was so incredibly high. Our GWAS identifies an association between GWAS, just show you. Let's see if I can find here. I let they give a good example of the GWAS. And da, 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 da. Ah, well, probably went too far down. Let's just see. And I'll have a link to the study as well. Uh, yeah, GWAS identifies the HLA region associated with severe reaction to COVID-19 vaccination. And it's called the genome right there, genome wide association study. Just to give you a highlight. All right. And so looking at phenotypes and things like that. And so here we are. Our genome wide study identifies an association between severe difficulties with daily routine after vaccination and HLA A03 colon 01. And remember what that was most associated with? 15% of the people of the European ancestry. This association was statistically significant only for those who received the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. So it doesn't mean that, for example, the other people weren't getting wiped out. 19% severe reaction at the second dose of Moderna. I was like, wow. And but still, but they found that it found at least a weakness in reference to the Pfizer BioNTech and a mild one in reference to the Moderna, uh, despite similar sample sizes for the study. In Pfizer BioNTech recipients, HLA A 0301 was associated with a two fold increase in the risk of severe, severe vaccine reactions. This effect was consistent across ages, sexes, and whether the person had previously had COVID 19 infection. The reactions experienced by the HLA A da, 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 carriers are driven by associations with chills, fever, fatigue. And in general, or in general, feeling unwell, which I think if you had chills, fever, and fatigue, uh, the last one would be a given. But I'll link to the study as well. But again, with the main thing we're taking away from here is incredibly high, uh, severe uh, reactions from the survey participants. Uh, Again, for data analysts and confounding and what biases may play a role in reference to the individuals taking the survey, um, you know, that's an, that's far more than is being reported through the VAERS system. So you're talking one in five individuals after second dose. Would that even be approved if people are having severe reactions at that high a level? And then you're going to start vaccinating children? Seriously? Yeah, again, I, I have my doubts. Does, do, am I unjustified in that? I mean, really? Is If we look at the, if we bring this into the data analytics, which we'll do in a second. In fact, let's just do that right now, ready? Because I know people, they, they're making children sound dirty. And, and what is the true risk to the age group when you start vaccinating kids? Well, Let's look at the CDC data directly. And here we go. Ba, 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 ba. Where is it right here? I think so. Let's go right here. Just to give you, I'm going to bounce around a little bit in the data. And let's let's make this a little larger. All right, here it goes. So you can see. All right. Anyway, well, wherever we went. All right, so here's our CDC data. And this is all the United States. You see where the, the pointer is right there? One to four years of age every life is precious. And trust me, if there's only one person, it means the whole world. So it's not to belittle the individual statistically, but we're looking at the weight of events. And so how many, you know, vice versa, risk to benefit analysis. So if you're looking at, you know, this age group here, and then you're comparing that with a 19% severe reaction level, and you're a policymaker, Yo, yeah, it's it's like how huh, we look at this. That's the age group of reactions. Zero to seventeen years of age. Uh, COVID mortality has been six hundred and five, and that 
number itself may be inflated. 66, for example, one to four years of age. And now I was doing a little data analysis just for just for basically information. Florida, for example, has had no mortality of children between the ages of one and four years of age. And that's Florida's, if you want to break it down by state. And of course, they have very few lockdowns and school lockdowns and so on and so forth. So that's why I brought Florida up. This red line right here, this get away, represents the the average age of mortality uh, from COVID-19. It's all about risk to benefit ratios. And uh, that's where it comes down to. So again, if one in five chance of severe reaction, doesn't have to move up. It's, uh, I, I, again, it makes no sense. But into the data itself, here we go. I want to first also break down the European data source. And now let's go to the VARES first. Let's get that out of the way. All right, here we go. This is our vaccine averse event reporting system. And again, as that's coming up, let me reiterate the um, the disclaimer. They're basically contributed to incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, unverifiable, so on and so forth. Da, 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 da. All right, there it is it's on the front of the page. All right, right off the bat, let's go. Duplicated reports, just for those not familiar, if I can get this thing to move, there it goes. Duplicated reports, because remember I showed you in the video, the ones I did watch and how to pull information from the COVID database. You have to be really careful about duplicates because uh, it can really discredit your argument uh, per se. So out of 960,322 uh, reports filed to VAERS, 282,811 are duplicated, yielding us 667,511 actual individuals one individual may file multiple reports because they only have room on one report for five symptoms. And a lot of people have, have more than just five symptoms. And so it's forcing one individual to file multiple reports, which is inflated in the numbers, but you get the drift. All right, let's go. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's scroll down the information. I'm trying to make it a little faster uh, and more comprehensive. All right, there's the number of reactions. There's the vaccine. So the most reactions uh, you can see right there. This is the words. If you ever want to read the read what people are reporting, um, again, you go to my video on how to access data from the COVID. I mean, it's programming, but if you're in Python and things like that, um, it's it's quite enlightening. Uh, reported COVID vaccine reported to VARES need to be validated. The wording is extremely, extremely, extremely I mean, like ice cream and extreme at the same time extremely important reported to VARES and reports from VARES are two separate things. So the mortality here is reported to VARES. Now, again, to reiterate and also recognize the fact is looking at that last survey that we did in reference to the study in the genetic susceptibility to vaccine reactions, uh, it is postulated that only 1% of the reactions ever get reported to VARES itself. Um, I think that research needs to be looked into again, but regardless, uh, yeah, you get the drift. All right, after that, go into the data, 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 data. If you want to look at it, I don't have room on even the, 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 the screen anymore. This is all the reactions from 2021 so far compared to 2020. So there, that's what, if you want to look at that, safest vaccines ever, yeah. All right, after that, uh, let's get past all these word things. Nothing new, nothing new, nothing new, nothing new for expediency. This is the most common reactions right now. Let's look, make this a little smaller. We're gonna bounce for a second. Let's see. And so what we have here is, as the screen changes sizes, there it goes. And then it freezes for a second and then it bounces there, there it goes. So the reason I'm doing fatigue and hypersomnia is because there's a safety signal coming up where there's no classification for narcolepsy. And uh, it remember a couple of weeks ago, there was two articles that came out, research articles that noticed, noticed some sort of association with such extreme fatigue that people had a hard time staying awake. And that brought back memories to the original SARS-CoV-1 vaccine. And so we're looking for that. And Again, just look, looking for it. And then we have here, these are the reactions. And of course, we go by age. There's your myocarditis flag. 
uh, per se. Mortality does seem to be in the higher age groups without a doubt. And so on and so forth. Fatigue right about the middle of the road. So this could, you know, when I see this, that could be background rates, meaning the amount that normally uh, occurs in society as a whole. But when you see things like this, when this is normal background rate, I think it's the average age is 40, but it's showing up 26 on VARES. There's an issue. Uh, most common reactions coming up VARES right now. I broke it down to four categories. One is basically the most common ones. These are the, that directly the symptoms. We're not going to the symptom text of the database. We're going to the actual symptoms. And so we're looking at what there's actually a classification to report. So there's that if you want to look at that real fast. All right. Then we're looking at fairly common but not well reported. Uh, peripheral swelling, vaccination type pain, chest discomfort. Uh, some weird things here and there per se. Uh, product administered to patient in inappropriate age. That really happened a lot. And so because a lot of people, the parents were, believe it or not, a lot of the parents were fabricating this the child's age because they were so fearful that the you know the medical professional said, well, if they're if they're 18 but they look 16, you know, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and, and you know whatever, and so you get an idea. Expired product administered. Think of that. 8,000 cases of people administering expired vaccines. That's a new one. I didn't see that one last week unless it passed right by, but it just, just hit the, the fairly common one. Let's go not so common, uncommon. Uh, impaired workability, we know that quite a bit. Um, loss of personal independence in daily activities. We were seeing that from the, uh, the first study we're looking at. Unresponsive to stimuli. Um, that can mean quite a few different things. Limb discomfort. Yeah, you get some weird things. It doesn't mean doesn't mean the vaccine is related to it per se, but there there's some interesting reactions. And now for the rare ones. Uh, reports uncommon, not, not uncommon. We're not to the rare yet. Skin pain, we heard about that before. Uh, sneezing, that's interesting. Uh, product preparation issue, that's comforting. Poor quality product administered. What are they? What are they injecting? I mean, I'm not, I'm just, I mean, they, seriously, that's like, I, uh, where'd they get that? Is that the, the patient saying that or is that the medical professional? Um, let's see. And then we have rare. Um, we see this worded a lot of different ways. Sensitive skin. That's probably triggering oral herpes. Vaccination type mass. Facial pain. Uh you know, right down the line again, background rates are real important. And I'm just using this so you and I can see if anything starts popping up all of a sudden, moving up the scale, so to say. Uh, and that gives you an idea. Let's see if there's anything else. And that's just our vaccine reports. Uh, individuals that are disabled by age. And this one is individuals that perished. The median age, 75. Remember, we went through that before towards the top. And this gives you a breakdown. There's a few outliers there, um, but you can see right there, there there are actually many reports occurring from individuals now, which are younger, which have perished, and then that gets reported to VARES for them to identify. All right, now let's go to the European database. Now, there was a little shenanigans of reference to the European database. Remember last week? Uh, we'll get to that in a second. I'll show you. And well, remember there was they were saying how there you can't count on the, the fatality designation because the fatal designation may be applied to uh, you know two different symptoms like a person could have numb legs and numb hands and that could be two different reports that have a fatal designation but only one person perished. So I was reluctant to give an actual fatal designation number of fatal designations being reported to your uh, your vigilance. But then I ran through their database and tried to pull out the copies. And I'll show you how many duplicates there actually were. You ready? Here we go. Total serious events reported to VARES. Uh, not a VARES. Dura Vigilance. 5,026. Um, 5, All right. 
there's that. I'm surprised Janssen's even being administered anymore, but still just the same because it's like the, the 37 vaccines in all of Europe. After that, you can read. Now, this is what you're looking at right here. All right. And I'll go do, I will, I promise to show you how to pull data from the, the Dervid, uh, Dervigilance. If I could promise you first how to pronounce it. All right. So looking for death of fatal. Go through here and you see right here, the most common word to find is a fatal designation. And so often they will, they will not use the word death. They'll use the word fatal. And, oh, that's horrible. Um, person, um, uh, during pregnancy. And so, yeah, that, that, that you, again, and this, uh, that's reported by a healthcare professional. You know, they, these are, I read these things when I hear these celebrities go on TV, go, ah, yeah, this is the safest thing in the world. And I don't know if they're lying through their teeth or whatever it comes down to be, but I'm quite disappointed, you know, before they try social engineering, uh, do like a day's worth of research independently. And so basically, you know, and they all have this fatal designation. And so what I do is when we scrape the data from the database, you want to look for basically information, death or fatal, because often they will not use the word death. You'll use the word fatal. And yet they mean, see right here, where is the fatal results in death. Uh, so you got to look and you get, you have to scrape that way. And so we go through the designations here and give you an idea. There were only, oh gosh darn it, there were only I'll show you the copies in a second. Hang on a second. Yeah, there they are. Duplicates. For those that are in data anal uh, analyst, there are only 19 duplicates. Period. So 18,207 of those reports were actually fatal designations and they were not duplicated reports. Uh, so, but 19 of them were. So that's how many fatal designations were reported through their vigilance. I did not like that deception. I don't think it was intentional, but however, though, it was definitely superfluous. But here we go. Now, this is the total number of ports to endure vigilance. We're now at 1,181,121 total. There we are. And that's the fatal designations that are not duplicated or reported to endure vigilance. And I will show you how to pull data from endure vigilance, endure vigilance later on. And then the most common reactions, and I'll make a huge database pulling in the European data later on with the uh, US data. And these are the most serious reports uh, basically being submitted to the, the European Union. And you see death right there. So people will be tempted to say, oh, there's only been 3,223 deaths reported to endure vigilance. Uh, but it's not, often death is not used. There's often the word fatal is used. And you won't be able to pull it in the reactions because it's put into the notes. And so it creates a, a, a discord. And so, but there's the uh, most common ones uh, reported on the endure vigilance itself. And like, for example, our number one is fatigue and headache. There's chills and joint pains. Um, so you see, it's, it's interesting how the reporting tends to vary. All right, next after that, let's look at this. This is the age where I think we'll start off and give it a second because now every time I change pages, it takes a second before it goes. Boom, boom, boom. Come on. There it goes. All right. That's the average age of mortality we looked at right there. And in the United States, and this is the kids. I mean, every one of those lives, again, never to, to bemoan it. Uh, you know, but there are other far more threatening things like flu and influenza and so on and so forth. Uh, then basically to a majority of the children uh, than COVID, at least in this aspect. And so statistically, not being hypothetical or speculative uh, as like, I, I don't, I'm not into the un weaponizing uncertainty, but there it is. There's the age breakdown using a little bit of a um, scatter plot looking like a bubble plot. And then let's go down to the bottom here. So we'll look at Florida. The Florida I've been looking at quite a bit because, why? Because it's so politically polarized. Oh, here we go, new deaths per 100,000. This is the United States, this is a whole, remember? May 2020, 2.977 deaths per 100,000. November 21, 2.597. So we are actually made a little bit of improvement 
uh, over that time. Now the question is whether we spike here or not. So yeah, that's why I'm not been impressed by, you know, I look at the numbers. That's all it is. And I don't, I know we, if the vaccines were having the desired impact, then I expected this to be down here, not up here. Instead of something that's not working, instead of making a better vaccine, uh, we just keep on giving more people the same over and over again and expected the results to change. Data-wise, I don't know. I and mean, the media is complicit. Media is not doing anything. They're saying basically we're doing just as bad as we did back in May of last year than we are, than we are now. So it makes you think, doesn't it? All right, here we go. Da -da -da. Let's see how Florida's doing. Florida just gave up. They don't want to play anymore. And so let's see how they compare it to the rest of the states. Let's bring it up to as current as we possibly can. And we just went away. Where'd it go? It, oh, must have updated. Let's just see right here. All right, there we are. 0.17 mortality per 100,000 in Florida compared to uh, state of emergency California, 1.41 in lockdowns and everything else like that. Remember, Florida is supposed to fall to the face of the earth. New York, 0.85. Florida's doing better. In Texas, we know the challenges, but if we follow the patterns, we pretty much can pretty much say this is probably going to go down um, while the other states are probably going to go up a little bit, except for Florida. And so, I mean, depending on the mitigation strategy, because you notice what's happened is the mitigation strategies, they, they, you know, light or heavy, they seem to follow the same algorithmic pattern to some extent. But to proceed, and let's go to the next one, mutations. Do, do, do. Come on. There we go. Again, computers are running really slow to, today. All right, so we'll look at it real fast. And where did everything go? And there we are. Let's just go straight down here because I'm not trusting the system. Um, I'll go backwards. Let's go here first. Here we are. Let's make this smaller again. It's going to bounce. Now, this is basically going to be interesting because we got some interesting data here. And it would be great to show you if I can get there. Let's look at this. Now, remember, this is the vac people for people not familiar, this is fully vaccinated per 100 as of November 19th. And so here we go. Total cases per million. And this, what I'm doing right now, what you're showing right here, is these are the countries. So you see right there, it says Chile, Portugal, Singapore, Spain, United Arab Emirates. Those are the countries which have 81 to 100 people per 100 vaccinated. So I added one extra bar. And so because people are being vaccinated like crazy. Now, I want to show you something about Singapore, which you think you'll find quite interesting. And all I'm looking for is some sort of data to support uh, the conjecture being pushed on a global scale that you need uh, inoculations in order to get past what we're going to pass with. Let's look at reproduction rate. Show me anything that, and remember, this is reproduction rate for those not familiar, higher is not better. You have the highest reproduction rate in the countries with the greatest vaccination rate. Again, doesn't mean that vaccines are causing a higher reproduction rate, but I'm just saying, show me something on a real world level of the effectiveness. Look at this, new cases smooth per million. Again, same countries. Who are these little countries down here? Ghana, Iraq, uh, Kenya, Libya, Nicaragua. And who's these little guys? Algeria, Egypt, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. And so you get the idea. Just show me. And who are these guys? You know, show me. It's bottom line what it is. Now, here's some of the mortality per million. And these countries don't even have, I mean, it could be reporting issues. All right, I can give you that. I mean, the medical care, the medical systems are probably nowhere near as effective. But even then, you're taking a country where 60 to 70 percent of the people are, are vaccinated and uh, per hundred. And you're still coming out with weird, convoluted numbers. I just need to see something. Now, show you a little, uh, a little bit of a twist. We'll get past here. Da 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 da. da, da. When we have more time, I'll show you that later on. But let's check this out, right? Let's see. It. All right, so here we are. Now let's look at this. People fully vaccinated per hundred 
with human development index of 0.6 or greater. Singapore, 91.9 people out of 100 are vaccinated. 91.9. Now, herd immunity was supposed to happen, what, somewhere around here? You know, herd immunity. So, again, let's, let's see how that herd immunity is working out from an inoculation standpoint. So, here we go here. And this looks kind of a conf little confusing. Let's bring it like a little bit bigger. Let's see. I'm going to zoom in. And one more time. It's going to bounce for a second because I have no clue why. But it does, then it freezes, and wait to check this out. Come on here. Almost moved. There. Now that was that was exciting. And here we go again. Now check this out. There we go. We got it. We got it. We got it. Let's see. Here it goes. Look at this little chart here. This is uh, a scatter matrix. So people fully vaccinated per hundred to new cases smooth per million. Let's find Singapore. Ready? Singapore. Look at this. And then all of a sudden, boom. People fully vaccinated is right here. A new case is smooth per million. It's like, whoa. You have 91 point. The positivity rate. Look at that. New death smooth per million. Look at that. Where is the benefit to basically the vaccination? Let's check it out. Let's check out another one. United Arab Emirates. Let's see. Now nah, they're all across the board. I don't know how they're reporting. But you get the idea. It's just like it's just like weird. They have a little bit of a decrease, but their reporting is like is wonky. So let's not go back to Singapore. But you you see exactly what it is as far as where what are we looking at? And, you know, if even if you conclude the United Arab Emirates and you say they're act, the reporting is accurate, it's, let's look at Portugal. How's Portugal doing? Now, that one I can't figure out. They're all across the board. Now, see Portugal's, it's New Decimal Per Million. And their chart is wonky too. New cases moved per million people fully vaccinated. So it's not on a timeline, so we're right here. It's innocuous. That's a little face right there. Looks like a charm. But you get the idea. And so I'm looking for some sort of something I can look at. It's like a circle of particles all over the place. Look, that's even an arrow. And so I'm looking all across the board and going, wait a second, show me some sort of strong correlation that's all i want to see and so we go down the line there and let's see if there's anything else that pops up here we are and let's make this smaller again which means we're going to freeze and bounce and let's see if i can pause step there guys it's actually almost fast i want to oh, there it is almost and i'm going to pause up there there we go oh this is horrible stop it I'm going to pause until I get a full bearing on this. Yep, there it is. So I don't want you to endure that bouncing all over the place. So here it is. Now check this out. So here we go. Fully vaccinated. There's your Singapore, United Arab Emirates, Portugal. Deaths per million. All right. Let's look at that. All across the board. And there's per right in the middle. Reproduction rates. All across the board. Cases per million. Again, all across the board. I would expect to see like numbers being really low, but we go to fully vaccinated per 100. And there we have it. So I'm just trying to see, I'm just trying to find something that, that's tangible that can actually show me on a global scale uh, the claims that are being made uh, validated it. And I don't think that's too much to ask. I mean, at all. All right, and I think we're here. And then we'll go to the web scrape. Da, da, da. And I think we are done for the night. The file, the fact, various file comparisons, so on and so forth. So let's recap real fast. Here we go. Let's go. So first off, we covered 
we opened up with the da, da, the genetics and the severe reactions. There seems to be a genetic association between certain individuals that have severe reactions. Never mind the fact that from this survey that after the second vaccine, people have severe extreme difficulties, sometimes as high as 19.5% out of vaccine participants. So I use the word participants. Uh, there's other words I could use, but I think that's the word I probably can get away with using, vaccine. Unvoluntary vaccine participants. That's that's probably, unless I'm sure a lot of people are voluntarily, but I guarantee more people are coerced into being uh, inoculated than actually uh, motivated on a other scale, it seems like. If you want to eat, have a job, and do things like that. And so, but 19.5%, uh, that's amazing uh, or disturbing, depending on how you look at it. Uh, depending on individuals, especially from um, that have the HLA A3031, which is le human leukocyte antigen. All right, then what else we covered too? Let's go backwards. All right, there's the databases. Conclusion from large prison cohort study. Um, the vaccinated individuals can be no less infectious than unvaccinated individuals. Back here, following. Malaria, not saying get malaria, but individuals that have survived malaria to some extent uh, or had exposure to malaria, it really is, it's like, it's like, again, for Africa, it's like COVID what? Uh, again, the pandemic mitigation uh, effects had probably much more deterioris, uh, de detrimental effect to the people of the countries, the continent, uh, than basically probably anything else in reference to how we view the pandemic from our um, narrow global view. But otherwise, for them, it's like, wow. I mean, just an amazing... It, they breeze through it because of everything else they had to deal with. And of course, they said because it helped build their immune system. Interesting. All right, here's that. Uh, immunosuppressants, a lot of individuals. Great article as far as expressing that there are uh, measuring antibody levels is not the same as measuring the quality of the antibody levels. And that people on immunosuppressants should be aware of that. Uh, so that's the takeaway from the article itself. And also too, uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is not because to discourage people from inoculation aspect, is to encourage other prophylactic measures that could actually have some impact in protecting these individuals, which could be on immunocompromised or immunosuppressed or taking medications. I mean, seriously, there's a lot of good options being researched out there, like some of the ones we looked at, for example, uh, that are basically like this disulfiram. Uh, why not? I mean, why, why just pretend? Actually, go to something that has a good observational uh, impact. But let's go back to this. What have we covered? All right. After that, they found that individuals that already had COVID-19 did not get reinfected. No reinfection rates. Again, the link will be there to that study. Nature. Yeah, you think you'd have a pandemic and lockdowns, and nature would get better. But in the way we did it, no. All right. After that, uh, basically. One of the major specific uh, correlations between a poor outcome and COVID-19 was hypernatremia, which either could be high salt concentrations or not drinking enough water. Interesting. Simple, simple, simple mitigation factor. Repurposing a familiar drug, uh, again, out of Harvard Medical School, disulfiram, amazing. I mean, 2,233 people and their veterans, no one had perished compared to basically individuals not on the medication. 3% did. Interesting. All right. And then we have Thapscargan, deadly carrot. Incredibly, incredibly, again, potential. Again, it is not about being against inoculation. It is against basically, or I should say, encouraging other forms of avenues, which could basically possibly be more effective. And how many we have we covered over this entire time? We've been doing all these videos for over a year now. Um, uh, again, DAPS Garrigan, DAPS, you know, as far as a possible uh, impact against all variants. I wouldn't go doing it on your own, obviously. But however, though, as far as the research, and uh, maybe it is, uh, DAPS Garrigan, I want to say DAPS Garrigan, 
Then folk medicine treated rheumatic pain and lung disease and female infertility, I guess, for for many, many centuries. So we've been using it. So again, but caveat it just the same, and it looks very powerful against other respiratory viruses. So what the heck? After that, we look at da 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 beta glucons. More research on the way. Wonderful portal article that can link you to other studies in reference to basically how it works in the pandemic mitigation factors in regards to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, really, really kind of cool. After that, we look at L-arginine, and we looked at this many times it's come up now. I think it's like the sixth research article uh, in regard to L-arginine and NO. Uh, very potent, very powerful. It seems like something's there. Uh, so I'll have the link there as well. Vitamin D, correlation. I mean, we've correlated it so many times. A lot of of correlations, tons of correlations. But again, uh, someday it will make it full venue into our medical establishment per se. Uh, it looks more effective than other things that are out there. Not gonna say what, but here we go. And then vitamin D, wonderful, wonderful uh, protocol that has been utilized by these particular researchers, which the link will be there as well. And just really, really, really cool stuff that can make a difference in improving people's lives. And, you know, and not just against the pandemic of the day, but just general health overall. If anything, that's one thing this pandemic has done is basically it has is, is really highlighted uh, the mal, uh, malnourishment that is going on in modern societies and how even the wealthiest nations can be incredibly deficient in basically rudimentary nutrients, which will leave you susceptible, not just to pandemics, but just about anything for some coming to basically, you know, stepping on a nail or a bad infection or whatever, you know, a common everyday, um, you know, what are maladies, what you want to call them. So that's the one thing this pandemic has done. And that's the one regret I do have is the fact is a lot of these local governments, the local governments, global governments can really have made a huge difference in improving the nutritional uh, awareness of entire societies instead of just going lock down the mask inoculate. That's not gonna change behavior for the better. That's reactionary. You want an active society, not a reactionary society. But again, that's all that we cover for tonight. Again, I did but the diatribe, I digress. And otherwise, just the same. It's been an hour and 22 minutes. Oh, we're running a little bit over time. Again, thank you for listening. Gratitude for all the researchers. Waitlist for, uh, renders in 4K. And then I'll have a little bookmark for you. But as always, I really, really am humbled that you watch. And if you watch this long, it's pretty incredible. But still, just the same. It's the information's out there. It's just got to somehow get traction and pick up into the regular medical establishments. The medical uh, learning, uh, you know, universities and so on and so forth, they're doing actually a great job. Uh, but again, a lot of the research they're doing is is not gaining traction. And so much for our pandemic mitigation teams, but whatever. But otherwise, just the same, Ralph signing off. And good night, and I'll catch you all good night or good morning. And I'll see you all next time. Catch you then. Bye.